I want to explore with you all today the question of who wins in the new energy economy. Is it Houston or is it Silicon Valley? Because I think this has profound implications for our city and how we evolve and the sorts of businesses that, that we see over the next 50 years here in Houston. And my perspective in this uh, comes from the wind energy business. Um, and when I got in the business in the, in the late 90s, uh, everybody else in town was working for that company with a big E out front. Uh, my other friends were doing, becoming dot-com gazillionaires. And uh, I was in a business that some termed, uh, that some called uh, an unholy marriage of hippies and accountants. <laughs> but uh, we believed in the promise that maybe this technology would get better, that maybe the country would start taking clean energy a little bit more seriously. And uh, we happened to start doing it at a time when, when, the, when the wind industry really took off, and driven by technology and an increased interest in, in clean energy. So uh, over the last 10 years, we've seen compounded growth in the wind business of around 35% a year. Uh, we're now at about uh, uh, 45,000 megawatts across the country. Uh, this is uh, versus an installed base of uh, uh, around 1,000 a, a a thousand, uh, um, excuse me, uh, a million megawatts uh, installed, installed around the US. Uh, on the solar side of things, we've seen a similar rate of growth with a very dramatic uh, uptick in solar installations, again, driven by uh, improved technology and, and greater interest in clean energy, uh, so that uh, 2010 was a banner year and almost doubled uh, installations from previous years. So where, where does this take us now, and where, what's, what's, what's been behind all of this? And uh, the main things have been on the, uh, on the, basically on the demand side and on the supply side. On the, on the demand side, uh, what's driven the growth in renewable energy is something called the Renewable Portfolio Standard, or sometimes a called the Renewable Energy Standard. And these are rules that basically say that electric power providers will get an increasing percentage of their energy from, from clean sources. Uh, Governor Bush, uh, this is not as well known uh, as, as some might think, but Governor Bush in, two, in, uh, two, in 1999 signed something called SB7, and it said, here in Texas, we're going to get an increasing amount of electricity from, from clean energy sources. And that was a very simple law, and it kicked off dramatic growth, and it really sort of uh, got, it was part of the deregulation, and I think what it did more than anything else was change the mindset of, uh, of the electric power industry to say, okay, this can be part of the mix, and it kicked off uh, growth that we'll talk about in a second that's been really important uh, here in Texas. And across the country, uh, just more than well over half our states now have either renewable energy goals or statutes, and that's driving demand across the country. These statu these, these, this legislation combined uh, with federal incentives have, have driven the, both solar and wind uh, quite dramatically. And under, uh, th there's a lot of talk these days about which sorts of energy are we subsidizing. We actually put uh, a lot more federal subsidies into, into conventional energy sources uh, at, than we do in renewable energy sources. By volume, uh, I think it's, it's fair to say that on a per energy unit, uh, fossil energies, fossil subsidies are a little bit lower, uh, but the total dollars that we're dedicating to incentivizing fossil production are actually uh, considerably higher than what we're doing uh, on, on the renewable energy side. And this uh, has, has meant, in Texas, has been particularly adept, as I mentioned, uh, the, the Governor Bush kicked off uh, a, a very dramatic uptick in, in wind energy. Today, in Texas, you get about 9% of your electricity from wind energy sources. And 1% or 2% or any percentage of anything in the energy business is a huge amount. If you just look, uh, just look at this room, one in 10 light bulbs are powered by wind. Uh, look at this projector, one-tenth of the area uh, powered by wind energy. This is a dramatic amount of energy. And 
what's, what's driven this in Texas is that uh, periodically natural gas drives the price of electricity. Uh, and at various points in time, if you're buying wind instead of uh, gas-fired electricity, you're actually saving a lot of money. So as rate payers, which many of you are, uh, you're saving money due to the fact that we get about 10% of our electricity from wind. In fact, on a good day, on a windy day in Texas, that percentage goes as high as 26%, which is a pretty dramatic amount of electricity when you think, particularly given the uh, intensive nature of our electricity consumption here in Texas. So Texas, uh, uh, the other thing, gas on the margin has driven growth in the industry, the, the renewable energy legislation, which really hasn't been, it just kind of kick-started the business in Texas, but, uh, but hasn't been the, the big driver. We're way, way, way ahead of our, of our compliance goals. Uh, and there's relatively few permitting obstacles. Uh, in Texas, you can, you can do with your land pretty much what you wish to do. Uh, on, so where are we nationally? Nationally, we're, at about, we're a little north of 2% of our electricity coming from wind power. Again, any percentage of anything is a lot. Uh, we are at about 10% renewable. We get uh, about 45% of our, of our electricity comes from coal and, and then so on from other sources. So we got a lot of headroom. We got a lot of growth. And uh, this is a, a picture that gets venture capitalists quite excited because they remember the days when uh, wind, when, when uh, uh, personal computer sales uh, outstripped uh, mainframe computer sales. They remember the day that in the early 90s when cell phone installations exceeded uh, landline installations. And in, in a couple of years ago, uh, renewable energy installations exceeded uh, conventional uh, power production facilities. So this is, this is arguably an inflection point. Uh, but I think it's very important to think about this inflection point. And does this inflection point really mean anything? Only if you think about energy uh, or renewable energy in terms of infrastructure as opposed to this sort of miniaturization technology revolution because infrastructure requires tremendous amounts of money, very tough decisions uh, about where to site facilities. Everybody wants infrastructure, everybody wants this clean energy, but there's a lot of discussion about where it ought to go. And this is gonna require a lot of national leadership. So, and one of the reasons why is fundamentally with renewable energy, we're talking about tapping fairly uh, light, dispersed, gentle sources of energy, sunshine and wind. And generally, you know, you can, you can be outside in the sun and you're okay. You can be in a windstorm, you know, in a windy area and it doesn't, doesn't sort of blow you away or knock you over. So we have to have massive gathering apparatus and big infrastructure to move this energy around. And there's no Moore's law uh, in, in renewable energy. This is a, uh, these are charts of improvements on, the, on solar, se solar cell efficiency and semiconductors. And these graphs look quite similar. The only problem is that uh, on the uh, semiconductor side of the equation, those improvements are on a logarithmic scale and the other ones are on a linear scale. So we're making a uh, nice headway in solar, but even the best solar cells out there they, get, they take about 45% of the electricity from the sun and turn it into electricity, okay? So even if you get 100% efficiency and every ounce of sunshine gets turned into electricity, you still need a lot of solar panels and they need to go uh, in, in, in a lot of different places. So that's one of the big challenges. On the, on the wind side of things, uh, we have other laws of physics. Uh, we have this thing called Betts Law, which basically says that even at its maximum point of efficiency, a, uh, a turbine of any type, gas, wind, whatever, can only get 59% uh, of the energy that's passing through it because at some point the turbine is blocking the passage of, of whatever gas it is so it can't get all the energy. Uh, so we do see big, very exciting improvements uh, on the wind side of things. This graph basically shows uh, evolutions of, of, of turbine technology over the last 10 years. And uh, as you can see, uh, across the spectrum, both for areas of the country that aren't particularly windy 
and for areas that are very windy. We're getting better and better at grabbing that energy. And the way we do that, we have taller towers, which pokes us into windier areas. We have bigger blades. We have much smarter controls. So the controls on a wind turbine are looking at the wind, and if they're down, if the wind blows harder up high, then it goes down low. So the turbine actually adjusts the blades as it sweeps around, and that enables it to get more and more energy. So these are very exciting developments, but at the end of the day, we're talking about harnessing fairly dispersed types of energy. So uh, just to give you some sense of this, if you wanted to replace uh, a very large coal plant, a 1600 megawatt coal plant, you would need around 2,000 turbines, which are a lot of turbines. And it would be a very good thing to replace one of these 1600 megawatt coal plants, but it's going to take a lot of uh, know-how to make that happen. Uh, the other big challenge that we have, and this is what, what our company is working on, is the energy isn't always where the people are. And we have pretty good ways today to move around other types of energy. We have trains that move coal, we got gas pipelines that move gas, uh, we got trucks that can move uranium. And we've solved the problem basically, and we have a, a whole set of legal infrastructure put together to move around those types of energy. But to move the new types of energy, we don't have as much infrastructure, so we're going to need that. Uh, the other issue that, 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 that this movement toward other cleaner forms of energy raises is where do you put this stuff? And uh, in 2004 uh, or 2005, President Bush in his State of the Union address said, we're going to get 20% of our electricity from wind. I don't know if you guys remember. We remember this very well. <laughs> uh, and we've quoted him on that. And uh, so a bunch of us got together and said, OK, what is this going to take? How much land is this going to take? And it's actually not all that much. And this is a study that a whole bunch of us did. And it gives you some sense of the impact. And the big squares there are, if you drive out in West Texas, you'll see a ranch that has uh, turbines that are usually pretty widely spread out around a particular ranch. And that's because you've got to separate these things so they don't steal wind from one another. And the small dots are actually the physical impact. And it's not uh, all that much. Uh, so. On the solar side of thing, if we say, okay, let's get 20% from wind, and there's big technical challenges to do that, but it can absolutely be done. 20% from wind, and let's go 20% solar as well while we're at it. And that would require uh, uh, solar panels spread out around an area around the size of New Jersey. And as you all know, New Jersey would fit quite handily in many counties in West Texas. So. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, not, that's a challenge, but it's not, it's not an overwhelming one. Uh, so then the question becomes, what, does, what is the role of Houston in all of this? And what, what can we do? And what's likely to, is this a threatening development? Uh, are we all going to be put out of business? And are we all, do we all have to move to Silicon Valley? Or, or what, do, what does this mean for the city of Houston? And I think that this actually represents a tremendous opportunity. And it's largely because, uh, as, as, I, as we've seen, this is an infrastructure challenge. And it's a combination of brains, because we do need to continue to improve on the technology side. And, but it's also a question of broad. And in, here in Houston, uh, if you want to put together a half a billion dollar project, you can find plenty of lawyers who can help you structure that. And they're used to doing that. If you want to find lawyers who can help you uh, find your way through the permitting morass in any state in the country, there's plenty of lawyers to help you do that. If you need right-of-way agents to acquire some of this land here, we've got lots of right-of-way agents in Houston because we've been doing this stuff for a very long time. If you need project management skills, those skills are out there and available. And uh, if, if you need a, an environment where people embrace crazy people with new ideas, <laughs> Houston is also a good town for that. Uh, and then the question becomes, do we have the right attitude for this? Are we ready to embrace this? And I actually uh, have personal experience with that. Uh, one of the things that, that uh, when I was thinking about running for Congress, there were two sort of threshold questions that we wanted to make sure that the electorate could get over. And one of them 
Uh, and so you, what one does is you, you, know, you, you hire a pollster and they go ask 400 people and, and you get an answer and hopefully it's the answer that you want, maybe not the answer that your spouse wants. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so we ask the question, if a, this is all anonymous because meanwhile I'm, I'm working on my day job and, and don't really want to know, everybody know that I'm thinking about leaving. So uh, we ask the question it, um, of voters in Houston, would you uh, take an interest or would you consider voting for somebody with a renewable energy background? And the answer was an absolute overwhelming yes. Uh, over 80% of the electorate said that was no problem whatsoever. And I think that that's because there is an understanding in this town that uh, oil is important, natural gas is important, uh, electricity is important, and other types of other ways to generate electricity are very important. So I think attitudinally, we can get this absolutely right. The other question I think that, 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 that I'll leave you with is, do we have the right sort of social infrastructure um, and the right amenities to continue to attract the, you know, the, the much sought after creative classes who want to be involved in this. And there, I do think that we have some work to do. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of wonderful things about Houston, but I've had too many conversations with recruits uh, that we're trying to attract to Houston and say, well, I don't like the polluter there, or uh, what do you do outside? or how do I, where are the parks? And so we have a lot of work to do uh, in that particular area. But other than that, I think we have absolutely all of the ingredients right here in Houston to play, to take our rightful role in the new energy economy. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.